So if we now have representative government in name only and are governed instead by corporations and their lobbyists, what's to be done? Tim DeChristopher wrestled with that reality and decided what he would do. As a result, he spent almost two years in prison. He's out now, and you can learn the whole story in the new documentary, Bitter 70. In December 2008, as the Bush administration was coming to an end, this environmental activist, then 27 years old, went to an auction of gas and oil drilling rights on more than 150,000 acres of Utah wilderness, all of it public land. It was a sale that Christopher believed to be illegal. Instead of getting dragged out, they said, hi, are you here for the auction? And I said, yes, I am. And they said, are you here to be a bidder? And I said, well, yes, I am. I'm two and a quarter in the back and not a two and a half. I saw right away that with that bid card that they'd given me, I could really disrupt this process. I had all these visions of my future and, and all the catastrophic effects of climate change. But if I start to bid on this, there's a decent chance I could go to prison. Could I live with that? And I thought, well, yeah, it would suck, but I could live with it. and four and five. And I finally took that step and, and jumped all the way in and started winning parcels. I uh, started winning all the parcels. Are you all you all them at fifty dollars? So fifty dollars to be the number seventy. An environmentalist threw a controversial oil and gas lease auction into turmoil today. Well, Tim DeChristopher says he's willing to go to jail, and it's possible that's where he'll wind up. A college student may face federal criminal charges for disrupting that auction with bogus bids. The federal government indicted Tim DeChristopher on two felony counts, even though the oil and gas auction had been quickly declared null and void by the new Obama administration and its interior secretary, Ken Salazar. Because of the need to review these parcels and because of their proximity to landscapes of national significance, I have directed the Bureau of Land Management not to accept the bids on the 77 parcels. To see this land uh, in this view, there's no way that I could ever regret what I did. <laughs> to, to see that the land looks like this, that it's this beautiful, and to know it's gonna keep looking like this. It's still gonna look this way, and there's not gonna be uh, an oil rig in the way. There's not gonna be a road cut right through the middle of it. That's, that's really reaffirming, um, and I think really justifies my actions. The legal process dragged on. Tim DeChristopher held out for a trial by jury, despite government attempts to make a deal. I've been offered a couple of informal plea bargains, and the one formal one was for as little as 30 days in jail. My lawyer said, they do really want you to serve some time to set an example that discourages other people from doing this. And I, and I said, that's exactly why I'm not gonna take this deal, because <laughs> I have the opposite motivation. And it's really rubbed me the wrong way about any kind of solution that doesn't involve a jury. The jury was instructed by the judge to rule only on the strict letter of the law and not to make any moral judgments. They found him to Christopher guilty and he was sentenced to two years in federal prison. Outside the courtroom, activists from Peaceful Uprising, the grassroots environmental group that Christopher co-founded, protested the verdict. 26 were arrested. Now Tim DeChristopher is free and contemplating both his own future and that of the climate change movement in the name of which he said he had picked up that bitter card with the number 70. Welcome, Tim. Thanks for having me. You are free. Five years have passed, two of them in prison. Was it worth that much of your time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, uh, I think more so than uh, I anticipated. You know, when I went into this, I was pretty focused on the direct impacts of my actions, uh, keeping that oil in the ground under those parcels and stopping this particular auction. And, and that was mostly effective. Um, that goal was met. And I think the impacts on myself and on the climate movement over the past few years um, and on the community of people that has, has grown up around that action, um, the, the group Peaceful Uprising that I helped start, uh, I think those impacts turned out to be much more important than just keeping that oil in the ground. So when did you know for sure that you were going to be convicted? During the jury selection of the trial. Um, that, that was what really did it. Um, there was a, a moment during the jury selection, we had this huge jury pool because it was a high-profile case. And there was a moment where the prosecution and the judge 
found out that most of that jury pool had gotten a pamphlet before they came in on the first day from the Fully Informed Jurors Association. And, and it was a pamphlet that didn't say anything about my case, but it talked about juries' rights. It talked about why we have juries, and it you know, quoted the founders of the country um, on, on juries being the conscience of the community. And, uh, and the prosecution flipped out over this. Um, it was the only time I saw the prosecutor completely lose his cool during the whole process. Mm -hmm. and, and we went into the judges' chambers, and the prosecutor was screaming and saying, we should have a mistrial here. Um, and, and wanted to just throw the whole thing out. Um, because of this pamphlet that we're Right, right. I mean, the prosecutor was, was almost spitting when he was reading from this and saying, this notion of voting your conscience, it's out in space. And, <laughs> and, uh, and he was terrified. He was, he was really scared of, of what was on that pamphlet. And, and then rather than uh, get rid of the whole jury poll, the, the judge called the jurors in one at a time to his chambers. Uh, and, and I was... Each one, individual, yeah. privately. Yeah. Um, and my, my legal team and I were on one side of the table. The prosecution was on the other side. The judge was at the head of the table. And there was one juror at a time at the other end. And the judge would say, you understand it's not your job to decide what's right or wrong here. Your job is to listen to what I say the law says, and you have to enforce it even if you think it's morally wrong. Can you do that? Can you follow my instructions even if you think they're morally wrong? And unless they said yes, they weren't on the jury. And, and I was sitting in the seat closest to the juror. And, and I watched one person after another say, yes, Your Honor, I'll do whatever you tell me to do, even if I think it's morally wrong. And they meant it. And, and that's when I knew that I was going to be convicted. Because they were going to decide if the law had been broken, not if it was a good law. Yeah, yeah. And the judge would de define for them what the boundaries of that law was. And, you know, so basically it was... If he committed this action, then he's guilty, and you have to convict him. Had you thought about whether it's the duty of a jury to uh, decide that an act is morally right or wrong, or to decide, in fact, if in the law has been broken? Not before I started the legal process. Um, you know, leading up to my trial, I was reading up about jury rights and jury nullification and the history of juries, um, and and why the founding fathers thought it was so important to have jury trials because you know they saw this system where if the government was passing laws that were out of line with the conscience of, of most of our society, people would refuse to follow that law, take their case before a jury of their peers, who, who would decide whether or not that law was you know, in, in accordance with their shared values and, and the conscience of our community. You, you talked a good bit about that in, your, in the statement you made at your sentencing hearing. You quoted the Founding Fathers, so I did a little research before I came here and came across John Adams, quote, it is not only the juror's right, but his duty to find the verdict according to his own best understanding, judgment, and conscience, though in direct opposition to the direction of the court. But that was over 200 years ago. And, and that's been part of the, the evolution of our legal system over the past 200 years, as we've evolved from uh, a people who set up a government afraid of the power of government, afraid of the concentration of power and wanting to keep power in the hands of people. And now we have a government that wants to concentrate as much power as they can and is afraid of the people. Um, you know, that's been the huge shift that we've had over, that, over the course of those centuries. And, and we've seen an extreme minimization of the role of the jury um, and a restriction on the right to a jury. You know, we have hardly any jury trials anymore. Hardly any of the people that I was locked up with in prison had gone through jury trials uh, because they're pressured into plea bargains. And, and it's just taken for granted by everyone in our legal system, de defense attorneys, judges, prosecutors, that defendants will be punished if they exercise their right to a jury trial. You know, the first thing a, a public defender will tell a, uh, one of their defendants is, you know, if you try to take this to trial, you'll get 30 years, you'll get 40 years. You, you know, if you need to make a plea bargain, so you just get 10 or 15. Um, and that's you know, considered a good deal. And if you're punished for exercising a right, then it's not a right. So essentially, the right to a, a jury trial no longer exists. So you, you're saying that the jury that convicted you and sent you to prison failed to act as, quote, the conscience of the community. Mm -hmm. Well, and there was a tremendous amount of pressure on them to do that. You know, I mean, these are people who have no experience, um, who 
have you know probably never been on jury duty before because it's a rare thing. Even though we're locking up unprecedented numbers of people, we have very few jury trials. So they, they don't have that kind of experience. And they come in to this huge courthouse, go through two different metal detectors and security screenings, come into this you know majestic court courtroom with the judge sitting up above them, speaking to them in this very patriarchal kind of way and with all this authority behind them and saying, it's not your job to do what's right or wrong. And, uh, and, and people believed that. And you know, watching that happen, it, I'd say it was the first time I really understood how some of the great atrocities in history could happen, where you have an, an entire population that you know, plays out the plans of, of a tyrannical dictator, how things like genocide could happen when people are willing to let go of their own moral agency and say, well, it's not my job to decide what's right or wrong. But, but in a country as large and diverse as, as this, how can we know that 12 people, much less one person, represent the conscience of the community? Uh, well, it's a big community, a yeah. lot of different opinions, beliefs, moral values, yeah. religious convictions. And you're certainly not going to get the same kind of answer every time. And that's why you know, civil disobedience is always uh, a risky thing. It does always involve uh, that risk of taking your case before a jury of 12 random people. Um, and, and it should. You know, to, to, to break an existing law, you should have to feel that strongly about it. You should have to be that confident that this law is out of line with the values of our community and, and, and be that willing to make that sacrifice. You know, I don't, I don't think it should be a, an easy or convenient thing. There should be that kind of risk involved in civil disobedience. Um, but by the same token, those citizens, those 12 citizens on the jury should be empowered and fully informed to, to make whatever kind of ruling they, they see is appropriate. Do you see any irony in the sentence you received, up to two years in prison, compared to what happened to BP? I mean, that oil spill killed 11 workers, injured 17, and wrecked havoc with the environment along the Gulf Coast. Yet no one from the company went to jail. They paid a big fine, but no one went to jail. Um, yeah, I mean, there's certainly irony there, but uh, I also think that the law is a tool of those in power. And, you know, it's corporations like BP that are in power right now. I mean, uh, Glenn Greenwald wrote a great book called uh, with liberty and justice for some, about how we have a two-tiered justice system in this country. We don't really have a rule of law. We have two justice systems. Um, and, and the division is not necessarily strictly between rich people and poor people. The division is between those that promote the concentration of power in the hands of the elite versus those that, that threaten to distribute that power uh, or take away some of that power. And I think part of the mistake that a lot of people make is thinking that the law or l words like legal are synonymous with moral um, or just. And, and that's not the case. I mean, um, most of our great examples of morality uh, throughout history are, are people who broke the law. That reminds me of a scene from the film. Take a look. There's been a lot of historical influences from civil disobedience that have influenced me. And you know, most of them were preaching nonviolence and this idea of nonviolence not meaning being soft, kind of a strong, peaceful resistance, and that power that comes through love. It doesn't start so much as with a movement of, of thinking as a movement of the heart. The young people who saw segregated uh, lunch counters in, uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina in 1960, those four students ignited a movement that ultimately involved hundreds and thousands of people because that movement of the heart touched the hearts of others. The initial preface of that revolution has to be a simple one. The civil rights movement kind of introduced the whole notion of the possibility of making social change happen. I think that's part of what my generation lacks is that we haven't had these, these tangible examples of what it looks like when when people take power and, and are committed to changing the system. Dr. King said, if I can get 5%, I can change the situation. I only need 
It's never a matter of the majority. It's always a matter of conscience, and conscience only operates through an individual. I was impressed with the statement you made in your uh, hearing, your sentencing hearing. You said, I say this, what you just talked about, the conscience of the community and why you were doing what you were doing. I say this not because I want your mercy, but because I want you to join me. Is there evidence that people are signing up in sufficient numbers for similar acts of civil disobedience to reach some kind of critical mass? Yeah, I think the, the numbers that it takes for civil disobedience, if people are actually committed to it, are not overwhelming majority numbers. Um, I mean, you know, for, for years there have been all these polls that say, you know, only half of Americans are, you know, believe climate change is happening or, you know, only a third of them actually understand what climate change really is. Those, those sort of polls happen all the time. Um, and, you know, they're generally presented in a kind of discouraging way. And I look at that and I say, well, that's plenty. You know, that's, <laughs> that's more than enough. That, that, you know, a third of Americans who might understand this issue, that's 100 million people. That's more than enough to create change in this country um, if those people are willing to actually act like they believe it. Uh, if, you know, if these are the people that understand that our children's future is on the line right now, if they're willing to act like that, then we can create the change that we need to. Did you see that cover of The Nation magazine recently? It's not warming, it's dying, referring to the earth. Yeah. Uh, do you agree with that, that, that it's more than global warming, it's actually an existential threat to the planet? Um, not really. Um, I mean, I think it's an existential threat to our industrial civilization. Um, it's, it's a threat to the kind of planet that we have evolved on, the kind of planet that we've always lived on. Um, but uh, I think both the planet and human beings are resilient. Um, and I think there will be some kind of survival. Um, the thing that scares me is what we will have to do in order to survive. What do you mean? Uh, whether we'll turn against each other. Um, you know, I mean, I, th I, don't think, I don't think 7 billion people can survive um, in a, in a climate-constricted world. Um, and it's that process of, of contraction uh, where things can get really ugly. Um, and, you know, I don't think it's, it's even to the direct impacts of it that is the scariest. I think the scariest is, um, you know, who's making the decisions during that time of chaos. Uh, and, and what kind of uh, drastic measures are we going to be willing to resort to? And again, that's where, you know, a lot of our historic atrocities happen. You know, if we look at places like Darfur, it's not the direct impacts of the water crisis and the water shortage that, they, that you know, is why Darfur is such a, a humanitarian crisis. It's because of what people were willing to do in the face of that crisis and the way that they turned against each other. Um, that's where things got really ugly. And, and I think those are, the, those are the challenges that we now face as a climate movement, uh, as, it's, as it's in all likelihood too late for any amount of emissions reductions to, to stop runaway climate change, um, which means that we are on this path of, of rapid change. Um, we know we're going down this path uh, of unprecedented change. Um, and so it's really important who is calling the shots during that time. The collapse of industrial civilization with an ignorant, apathetic citizenry that's afraid of their own government and feels like they have to accept whatever corporations want to do, that's really scary. That, that's really ugly. And, uh, and that's, uh, I think, the big challenge that we face now. You were quoted somewhere saying, quote, the climate justice movement is not looking for Walmart to be a friendlier corporate master. They want to overthrow Walmart. Can you help us understand what this means? We don't want Walmart to be a, a greener corporate citizen. Uh, we want Walmart to be subservient to human interests. We don't think corporations should be masters of men. And, and you know, that's really, that's the difference between the climate justice movement and the environmental movement, in my opinion, or, or the big green side of the environmental movement. Um, that we're not looking for a cleaner, greener version of the world that we have now. We're looking for a uh, a genuinely healthy and just world. I mean, people are driving hybrids and they are uh, urging businesses to go green and they're uh, 
trying to save energy here and there, but yet there's a recent uh, poll that shows people do not think about the environment in the terms they did the day after Earth Day back in 1971. They're not as concerned about it. Yeah, and you know, I think one of the weaknesses of the environmental movement um, and, and parts of the climate movement is that it's always encouraged people to think as consumers, to think about what they can do uh, in their consumer purchases, to drive in a hybrid, of you know, buying the right light bulbs and that sort of thing. Um, and, and I think that's understandable because we have so many reminders of our role as a, as a consumer. You know, we see like 3,000 advertisements a day that all remind us, you're a consumer, that's who you are. Um, and we don't have nearly as many reminders that we're also citizens of what was once the greatest democracy in the world. We're also human beings and community members who can connect with one another and inspire one another. Uh, and these are also ways that we can be powerful, you know. Um, and, and these are also the ways that we need to engage. And, and I, think, I think there's more of that now. I think in the past few years, especially for the younger generation, there's been more of the reminders that we are citizens, that we can shape our society. And, and there's been this resurgence of, of people power, uh, which I think will have big reverberations. The way the environmental movement has been for the past 30 years is like a football game. And there's some players on the field that are fighting it out, but most of the people in the stadium are up in the stands. Most of them just paid their, their money at the door, and now they're just yelling and screaming, and, and it's not working. Our, our team is getting slaughtered. The refs have been paid off, and the, the other side is playing with dirty tricks. And so it's no longer acceptable for us to stay in the stands. It's time to rush the field, and it's time to stop the game. You're occupying the Department of the Interior saying you're perpetuating climate change, destroying lives around the world. We're not gonna take that anymore, and we're gonna risk arrest. Much of what prepared me to be arrested in DC was the background and training I received through Peaceful Uprising, and I was ready. I was ready to get arrested. In all my 58 years, I have never taken that bold a stand. Tim has helped me to find my own strengths. I have a hunch that most people listening to us now, watching us now, uh, agree that our government has been captured by big money, big business, corporate America, but they don't know how, what to do about it. And unlike you, many of them married, have children, have obligations, own homes, two years in prison would totally disrupt their life and their commitments to others, their obligation to others. What do you say to those people? Uh, well, not everyone has to do what I did. Um, not everyone can, not everyone should. I think we need a, a diverse movement. You know, if we look at social movement history, the, the ones that have been most successful and most powerful uh, are the ones that have used a, a variety of tactics and a variety of strategies. Um, and I think, um, you know, not everyone has to go to prison, um, but I think everyone has to feel empowered to take strong actions. Um, and, you know, no one can say, this is the kind of action that we need right now, um, because nobody knows, nobody has the answers. Um, you know, nobody has ever stopped a climate crisis before. You know, so, so nobody can say, this is what's definitely gonna work. And, you know, that's what's limited us in the past in the movement, is when we've had one element that said, you know, listen, we know how change happens in Washington. We know how to do things. You know, this is what's politically feasible and you have to do it our way. You know, up until 2009 with the Waxman-Markey bill, that, that really held back the movement. And when, that bill did what? That was the cap and trade bill that, you know, was a big corporate handout bill um, written in collusion between the biggest green groups and some of our biggest corporate polluters like Shell and DuPont. You say it was a dividing line in the story. Yeah. Yeah, I think that bill was really the turning point for the climate movement because up until that point, the, the groups with so much money and access in Washington you know, held everybody in check, basically. Their, their rhetoric about this is what's politically feasible, 
that held sway with so many other folks in the movement um, who said, okay, well, I guess we'll do it your way, even though this bill doesn't really make sense and doesn't seem to do anything worthwhile, we'll do it your way. But they failed even to pass that bill. Uh, it turns out they didn't even know what was politically feasible. And, and so then, you know, the rest of the movement afterwards said, well, we tried it your way, and it didn't work. And now rather than start from what's politically feasible, we're going to start from what we know is necessary. And rather than working from, you know, what corporations tell us they'll accept, we're going to work for what we actually want, something that's actually in line with our vision for society. And, and so there's been this huge resurgence of the climate justice side of the movement um, and, and the real grassroots side of the climate movement over the past few years. Um, and, and that's, that's both uh, moved past the, the mainstream of the big green groups uh, and also swayed some of those big green groups. Well, I think you know that the president of the Sierra Club, Michael Broon, got himself arrested recently at a protest outside the White House over the Keystone Pipeline. The change in the Sierra Club has, has been a, a tremendous shift over the past few years. You know, when we look at the challenge that we have right now of, uh, of creating that drastic shift from where we are right now, where, you know, we have one party that, that doesn't believe in climate change and one party that provides empty rhetoric and no action, that, that's a dramatic shift that we need to, to get to actual uh, appropriate response to the climate crisis. Um, you know, to get us to that point, it, it's going to take really confrontational actions. I don't look at the political spectrum as this straight line between left and right. Um, I think it's more like a really steep pyramid. And, and I found that a lot of the people on the bottom have far more in common with each other regardless of whether or not they're on the left and the right than they do with anybody at the top of that pyramid. Let me double back to something you said a moment ago I let slip by uh, because it scares people to hear you and anybody else talk this way. You said we have to overthrow the corporations. What do you mean when you say overthrow corporate power? I mean get corporations into an economic role rather than a political role. Um, you know, corporations do have a role to play in our economy but they don't have a role to play in our government. Um, that they have a stake in policy, but they <laughs> corporations don't have a conscience, and so they they're not appropriate for being part of our political system. And and when I say overthrow, I mean ending corporate personhood. I mean kicking them out of our government, uh, and that will take a constitutional amendment to to get that to happen. Uh, and I think that'll be a, a dramatic shift. And I think it'll be a huge battle. They're not going to easily give that up. So you're not talking about using force to overthrow anybody? No. But you are calling for a radical overhaul of how our society functions. Yeah, but I think that's, a, that's an overhaul to bring us in alignment with our values. Um, you, you know, which, which is why I think that this is a, a challenge that we can actually rise up to. Uh, I don't think it's an impossible challenge because it's not primarily about changing people's values. Uh, I think most people, regardless of where they are politically, if you get them in an honest moment to really talk about what they value, they're not going to talk about that they value their, their SUV or they value you know, the, the extra few thousand square footage on their, their home. They're going to talk about human relationships. Almost everyone is going to be talking about their friends and their family and, and their communities as the things that they truly value. Um, and you know, when we're talking about that, that radical shift. It's about aligning our world with those values, um, not so much about changing them, which, which is why I think this is possible. So now that you're a free man, are you a danger to society? <laughs> there uh, are people who say you are. You know, I, I'm a danger to a certain part of society. Um, which I'm, part? I'm a danger to, the, to that part of the power structure that wants to concentrate power in the hands of the few. Um, uh, you know, I don't think I'm a danger to the rest of society. Don't you think the power structure in every age and every time and every place always sees civil disobedience as a threat? Uh, yeah, I mean, civil disobedience is always a criticism of the existing power structure. Uh, and, it's, and it's always been that way. Yeah, that's the role of civil disobedience. That's the role of dissent. What's next for you? Um, in the fall, I'll be going to Harvard Divinity School to study to become a Unitarian minister. 
not law school, but with your concern about juries and the founding fathers and civil disobedience? No, um, because I think a lot of what we're facing is really spiritual struggles. Um, I mean, I, you know, as I was saying, I think we have enough people on board, but, they're, but not enough people who really have faith in their own power to make a difference. Uh, and, and that to me is an internal struggle, something that's more on a spiritual level. And, it, it, and the take point, it a little further. What do you mean? Well, the, the spiritual. You level. know, the point where I fully decided, it's something that I'd been considering for a while, but the point that I fully decided that I was going to become a minister or, or go to divinity school was the same point that I mentioned earlier was when I knew that I was going to be convicted. Um, that point when I watched one juror after another say, yes, I'll, I'll do whatever you tell me to do, even if I think it's morally wrong. Um, that, that to me was a huge turning point because uh, I saw two things in that situation where the, the judge was telling people that they had to let go of their own moral authority. Um, you know, I saw how willing people were to let go of their moral authority, but at the same time, I saw the vulnerability of the prosecutor. And, you know, he's the U U.S. attorney. He's the U United States attorney. He, he represents the United States of America. He's got, he's got the whole power of the United States government behind him. And he was terrified. He felt vulnerable to the notion of citizens using their conscience in exercising their civic duties. In fairness to him, I read his statement. He said, he said respect for the law is the bedrock of a civilized society. Yeah, and, but the bedrock of the rule of law is the conscience of the community and the values of our citizenry. And, and I think that, that's where he, he missed it, you know, because at the same time he said uh, the, the rule of law is the bedrock of our society, not acts of civil disobedience. He failed to understand that acts of civil disobedience are what have shaped the rule of law in this country and how it's, it's been acts of civil disobedience that have made the rule of law line up with the values of, of our people. So what are the spiritual needs you think you would like to attempt to address? Well, I think part of it is um, the empowerment that comes through connecting with the community. And, and I think that's part of why uh, churches and religious institutions have played such an important role in so many social movements throughout our history. Uh, because there's, there's so much alienation, especially right now in our society. Um, and so much that encourages people to view themselves as an isolated individual. And, and I, as an isolated individual, people are weak. And, and they look at the problems that we face, and even if they understand these issues, they look at it and say, you know, I'm just one person. What can I do against these corporations or this government? They're so big and so powerful. Um, and that's true. And, you know, honestly, as an, is an isolated individual can't make a difference in any of these is issues. But, but people are not isolated individuals. They're connected to something much bigger than themselves. They tried to convince me that I was like a little finger out there on my own that could easily be broken. And all of you out here were the reminder for all of us that I wasn't just a finger all alone in there, but that I was connected to a hand with many fingers that could unite as one fist. And that that fist cannot be broken by the power that they have in there. That fist is not a symbol of violence. That fist is a symbol that we will not be misled into thinking we are alone. We will not be lied to and told we are weak. Right. We will not be divided and we will not back down. Right. That fist is a symbol that we are connected and that we are powerful. It's a symbol that we hold true to our vision of a healthy and just world and we are building the self-empowering movement to make it happen. Tim DeChristopher, I've truly enjoyed this conversation and I wish you well. Thank you.